Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody having a good finale so far? Yeah. How many people have just got here today? Okay. You've all got at least one day. Uh, so, first off, we're going to open with a couple of terrible statistician jokes that uh, are based off of actual observations and influence presentation. So, first off, I was told I had to make this presentation in 15 minutes. So last night, this morning, I ran through it a couple times. First time I ran through it, I got to 30 minutes. I'm like, I'm going to have to talk a lot more. So I'm like, all right. So this morning, I ran through it again. I got to 70 minutes. So I closed up my laptop and I'm ready. <laughs> also, I'd like to point out that the first, this is my third time speaking at CaliCon. Uh, my, first, my first time, I had a presentation the last session on Saturday. Yeah. There were like six people there. <laughs> the second time I had, like, right after lunch on the first day, I had a packed house. So today, I'm presenting a typical time with a typical audience. <laughs> uh, so, my name is Josh Infinite. I'm the head of reference and educational services librarian at Texas Tech School of Law. Uh, there's my contact, my email up there. If you ever want to talk to me, it's just my name with a period in between at TTU and ADU. Um, I am not a professional mathematician, statistician, or data analyst. Data analyst. Uh, I have a mathematical background. I have some graduate work in mathematics, including statistics and probability. But I haven't. I never did finish. It. I decided to go to law school instead. I have no idea what I was thinking. <laughs> Apparently, I was, you know, I played 9 11. Yeah. It was about that time. Um, so, first off, I have to ask a few questions here about the group. First off, are there any other math majors here besides me? Good. If you're a math major, you'll probably be very, very bored with what I'm going to talk about today. All right. So, of the people here, how many people are in IT or other tech things? All right, got a few people. How many people here are librarians? How many people are law faculty or other uh, support type? Anything else, I guess. I guess anybody who didn't raise their hand in the first two. Um, how many people here would say that you dislike or are scared of math? How many people just have no opinion on math? How many people love math? Oh, hey! <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, very for at the beginning, I'm going to kind of start talking about some background as to why I decided to do this. Talking about math, of mathophobia, uh, the math anxiety, math and whatnot, and how to overcome it. I'm going to talk a little bit about big data, which is why this sort of thing is becoming important. Then I'm going to get to the meat of this, which is really how to understand and talk about statistics and data reports. I'm not, I don't have the time to cover you know, how to do detailed data analysis, how to use all the tools that you would use and everything. There are literally PhD programs on that. There's no way I can condense it in the 50 minutes. What I am going to try to do is to help you understand what people are talking about when they talk about data, when they talk about reports, uh, when they talk about results, and so on. Uh, that's the focus of this talk, so that's what I'm going to spend most of my time on. It's mostly talking about terminology, so you can kind of understand what people are talking about when they talk about uh, various, when they start throwing around statistical terms, what they're talking about. Then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tools that are available some of which you probably have, some of which you have access to, and some of which you can get. So, is math scary? Um, I always look at this the same way as saying, are clowns scary? Clowns aren't really scary, but there are still people who are scared of them. I'm not going to make fun of you. Is anybody here afraid of clowns? Okay. Um, Admitting it is the first step to recovery. <laughs> uh, I will try and move on from the clown as soon as I can. 
Uh, math really isn't scary in itself. It's, it can be difficult, but it's not unsurmountable. Uh, you are more likely to be scared of math because you had a bad experience as a kid than you are because math is inherently scary. Lions are scary. Clowns aren't. So, what are the sources of math anxiety? Why do people have trouble with math? Um, and this really goes back to probably for you, if you have math anxiety, probably goes back to elementary school. Maybe junior high or high school, most likely elementary school. Part of it has to do with the fact that the way that we teach math, especially the way that the American school system has taught math over the last you know, century or so, is actually pretty terrible. Uh, there is a focus on getting the right answer right away, punishing you for wrong answers, for making mistakes. Where math is by where learning math is really an exploratory process. You have to make the mistakes, and it's okay to not get the right answer the first time as you're learning it. As a matter of fact, it's generally good because if you get the wrong answer, you can start to see why you got that answer and how uh, go back and see where you made the mistakes. But that's not the way that we teach math to, the youngest, to our youngest kids. They are taught to get it right, get it right the first time, get it right as fast as possible, and if you don't get it right, it's bad. Not to mention that, uh, especially, uh, well, really anybody who struggles with math is kind of told, well, you're just not good at it, as if that's supposed to be, you know, uh, an excuse to not have to worry about it anymore. But it's especially true for girls, uh, because we're, uh, our education system has just historically been awful. Uh, so odds are if you have math anxiety, it's because you had some sort of traumatic event that has made you think that you weren't good at it. The biggest thing that I've noticed though, uh, I've taught math to GRE and GMAT students who are doing uh, test prep. And the biggest thing that I've noticed is that people can say, I am struggling, I can't do this, are doing just fine until they tell themselves they can't do it. Uh, I remember a particular tutoring student who I was just guiding through um, some fairly simple algebra. They had all the steps right. And I said, and they just kind of stopped and said, I can't do this. I'm like, you're doing just fine. What do you mean you can't do this? Convincing yourself you can't do it is the number one cause of, the number one symptom, I should say, of math anxiety. You can do it. You just got to keep stopping yourself, telling yourself that you can do it. You can't tell yourself you can't. So really, there is an amount of positive thinking that goes into doing well in math. Uh, or even doing, not necessarily doing well, just doing it good enough. Now, you don't have to be good at doing calculations. The beauty of the modern world is that we've developed all sorts of calculators, computers, cell phones, abacuses, and all sorts of other things will do the calculations for you. The big thing is figuring out what you have to do, which calculations you actually need to do. And so if you can't remember how to add uh, you know, two 16-digit numbers together, that's fine. Excel will take care of that for you. You don't need to do that part. All you have to do is figure out which numbers you have to put into Excel so that it gives you out what you're looking for. And that's part of math. And that's the part that we're going to focus on is what is it that we're talking about? What do we need to know in order to understand the tools that we have? The other thing that uh, sort of prompted this is the rise of what's called big data. Now, we have been keeping data and statistics on uh, people, places, and things for is pretty much, at least as long as there's been writing, the first writing ever, the oldest writing found in the world is counting, it's the counting systems, it's keeping data on things. Now, 
for most of history, the amount of data that we've had to work with has been generally fairly small. And probably the biggest data collection project in human history up until uh, the 19th century was probably the Domesday Book, in which uh, William the Conqueror decided to count everybody in England. Uh, so censuses were the first big data collection projects. But data gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then uh, over the last 20 years with the advent of the internet and the incredible amount of connectivity that has arisen as a result of miniaturization and telecommunications, the amount of data that we collect has, gone, has grown exponentially. Uh, literally, we put, reproduce exabytes worth of data, that's like thousands of terabytes, every day. And, and it's just unfathomably large amounts. Now, you are probably not working with that much data, but you still have way more collection tools, uh, both things that just happen, and things that you can do on your own that collect data. And there is so much of it out there that uh, it's given us so much more opportunity to explore what we can learn from it. So how can we use it? I tend to look at data as either backward-looking or forward-looking. Uh, generally, once you collect the data, you really aren't looking at the present because by the time you have you get it to the point where you can analyze it, it's already the data is already from the past. So one of the things, the sort of backward-looking approach, is that you can look at sort of the snapshot in time of when you collected the data. What did everything look like? What is the picture that I can get of whatever it is I'm looking at at the time that I did this study, this survey, this data collection of whatever I've done? Now, that's great for understanding how things have gone in the past. And we can use that backward looking uh, view to try and figure out how things work, what the relationships between things are, and so on. But the real value of data is forward looking. It's not looking at how we uh, how we decide how we've done things in the past, because we can't really change any of that. But you, knowing how things relate can help us predict how things are going to go in the future. There's an entire, uh, anybody familiar with Nate Silver? Everybody know who he is? Anybody not know who he is? Okay, so just for people who don't know, Nate Silver uh, was formerly with the New York Times. He is now with his own site called 538.com. Uh, he did the election projections for the 2008 and 2012 elections, what he's very famous for. And he predicted, I think he got every state right as far as the presidential elections. And was very close on House and Senate results. Uh, based solely off of, you know, looking at polling data, looking at past results, looking at population. He had a big system for how he did it. And that was all, he started backwards to look at what he had, what, what the past could tell him and then went forwards with all the different variables he could and projected it out. Now he's developed an entire site called 538.com, which takes this sort of big data methodology and applies it to all sorts of things, from children's names to uh, projecting elections to sports and so on. I encourage you to check it out sometime. There's a lot of really interesting stuff there. Um, but I'm not going to talk about it too much more. So. Uh, but the sort of forward-looking idea is what really makes data useful. The downside to the revolution of big data is that it gives us so much information that it can be really overwhelming. Uh, figuring out what it is you can use, that's really tricky. A lot of data that gets collected is junk. Um, either collected in uh, either collected in a poor or otherwise sloppy manner, or doesn't tell us anything useful because uh, either it's not particularly relevant to anything, 
or what? There's so much out there that it's very difficult <coughs> working with raw data uh, to know what to work with. When you're collecting your own, you need to be careful to make sure you're only getting the inform only getting information that you need or that you think you might need. Getting superfluous information is just going to bury you with more and more data that you don't know that you're going to have to figure out how to sort through. Before we get into some of the technical terms, I'm going to talk a little bit about the perils of data. Uh, working with data is uh, dangerous. Uh, not like physically harmful or anything, but we can very easily end up with bad, with bad conclusions off of perfectly good data because of a number of things. Um, everybody's heard the term, I mean, everybody's probably heard the saying, there's lies, damn lies in statistics. Uh, and that's really, be, that's a saying that is true to an extent because it's very easy to read your own narratives, your own biases into um, your results, either from the data collection process or from choosing it from how you look at it. You might use your own biases unconsciously, of course, but your own biases will color the way you interpret the data. Some people can look at the same data and say, this is conclusive proof that uh, Americans now support same-sex marriage, and another person the same data says this is conclusive proof that Americans don't. Which, uh, people can, the fact that you can look at the same set of data and get opposite results is very telling, uh, at least from a narrative standpoint. Now, all data does tell a story, but that story is not particularly complicated or necessarily very enlightening on its own. You need some context, and you generally need to have more than just one study, one set of data, one survey, and so on. You have to look at how it changes over time, you have to look at how it relates to other uh, other variables, other points over time, or not over time, but at the same time, how do things relate to each other, and how, do, how does it change over time? That's really the story you need to read. And the other thing that people tend to do too easily when looking at data is to read causation into things. Uh, there's a uh, old LSAT question that uses an example that I like, so I'm going to use it. Um, the uh, uh, magazine saying that the study has shown that people uh, with laptop computers tend to have higher paying jobs. So people, this is from the 90s when laptops were really expensive. Um, so people who want to have a higher paying job should buy a laptop <coughs> computer. Well. That's part of the danger of reading causation in the things. Um, really, having a laptop computer didn't have anything, didn't cause you to have a higher paying job. If anything, it was the other way around, that people with higher paying jobs could afford to buy laptop computers. Now, laptops are much, much, much cheaper, so any broke college student can generally get one. But back then, you know, there were two, three thousand dollars a piece often, so. It was just weird to try and say you could get a higher paying job by buying one. Uh, and that's just an illustration of the danger of trying to read causation in things. Generally speaking, just because two things are related, you don't know from the data whether alone what's causing what. Uh, you, can find the, you can find that the two things have a relationship to each other. But that one does not mean that there's any causal relationship at all. And it certainly doesn't mean that it goes one way or the other. Uh, LSAT scores have a correlation to, higher LSAT scores have a correlation to higher bar pass rates. 
That does not mean that having a high LSAT score causes you to pass the bar. Other than the fact that it you get into law school so that you can then take the bar. But by that logic, being born helps you pass the bar. Uh, so uh, that's just one of the sort of cautions that you need to take into account. All right. So now let's get sort of the meat. I'm going to talk about the language of statistics, uh, which is really what I want to talk about, because this is how you're going to be able to understand when people talk about statistics and talk about data analysis and talk about their results. This is what you're going to need in order to sort of decide what they're talking about. Uh, and it will help you carry on and carry on a conversation with them once you can read their, their results and kind of have an idea of what they're talking about. It will help you know what the right questions to ask are when you look at data statistics and data results. Um, so that's kind of the big thing here. So we're going to start off very big with population. It's kind of the biggest thing that we have here. This, when we think of population, we kind of think of people. Uh, when you're doing a study, when you're taking data, the population is the entire group that you're trying to measure. Now, you may or may not survey or measure everybody in that in your population. Generally speaking, with a very small group, if I wanted to find out, like with this with people here, if I wanted to find out your opinions on something, it's very easy for you to just ask all of you because you're all here. But if I had a room of a thousand people, it would be a lot harder for me to get everybody's opinions without like maybe do polling software or something. But then not necessarily everybody would really answer. I might not even know exactly how many people in the room. So I have no idea when everybody is done. So I'm sometimes going to measure the whole population. Other times I'm going to make inferences about the population from measuring a smaller group. Now, that smaller group is what we call the sample. Uh, this is the portion of the population that we're trying to measure. So going back to uh, my example, if I want to make the opinions of everybody at Cali about something, it'd be very difficult for me to hear everybody. But I could use you guys as a sample. You are a portion of the population. And I could then make inferences about everybody attending Cali from the people in this room. The problem with that is going to be representation. Uh, a sample needs to be representative of the whole population. So it should have, when you're talking about people, it should have the rough, same rough demographics as the population of the whole. Uh, so this is the problem here is that with you guys, there's one thing that's not representative about that you guys are not representative of the whole group of Cali because you are the people who came to this presentation, which means you are more interested in this than the other things. So anything that I ask you about, uh, anything that might have, have to do with why you chose to come here as opposed to those, is probably going to skew my results. A sample that's not representative will cause problems with your results. The larger a sample is, the more likely it's going to be represented. We're going to come back to this in a little bit because this is very important. But uh, for when we talk about error, but larger sample sizes will tend to be more representative because you're including, it's harder and harder to exclude people of certain characteristics or certain elements of your population as you get larger and larger groups. All right, so a variable is some characteristic that's being measured or something that's being calculated. This is a point within your data. Uh, so if I was measuring, if I was taking a survey of my students, I might get their height, I might find out their undergraduate GPA, I might find out how much money they make a year, which for law students might not be very much if they're one of us. Um, each one of those things is a variable. 
And in one data collection, I might collect I might collect uh, data points for a number of different variables. Any which of any of those are going to be things that I can then do analysis on, and I can look at how they relate to each other. A data set is our collection of information that takes all of our different measure variables together. Usually when we talk about a data set, we're talking about from a single series of measurements. So if you do a survey to your students, the results are one data set. If you do that survey twice, you can look at it as two data sets at different points in time. If you're using the same students or using different students, you can look at it as one data set of all your students. All right, any questions about any of this stuff so far? This is the, we're at the, this is the most basic thing. This is the stuff that you probably have, probably know. All right, so now we're gonna start to get, we're gonna start getting more and more complicated. All right, a lot of people talk about averages. Um, average can mean a lot of different things. We tend to use it in one of two ways in general. I put it in quotes because it's not a statistical or mathematical term. Uh, we generally either mean the middle or the most com or something that's typical or common. Um, in statistics, we tend to use three different terms uh, that mean something similar to the average. When we talk about averages, we tend to be referring to one of these three things. Really, two of them. The third one I'm tacking on here because it does come up occasionally. Uh, we're either talking about the mean, the median, or the mode. So we're going to start off with the mean. This is probably the most, when, we, when people think of averages, this is, tends to be what most people think about. Um, the mean is the sort of value, if you were to pick a value at random out of our data set for a variable, the mean is the value we would expect that random thing to be, most likely. It probably won't be that exact value, but it's going to be most likely close to it. Uh, when we talk about the mean or the expected value, generally what we mean is taking all of the data points for a variable, adding them together, and dividing them by the number of variables, by the number of data points. So when you think about GPA, GPA is a mean. You take all the grade points you've earned, uh, divide them by the number of hours you've taken, and you get a GPA, a grade point average, which is a mean. That's the expected value that if you take a random class, that's what your grade would be. Uh, now, when we start getting to more complex distributions, larger data sets, and we get to equations that we can use to model data sets, the expected value can be a little bit more complicated to uh, calculate. But most of the time, mean, expected value, these are very important things, and this is what we're talking about most of the time. The other most common thing that we'll talk about when we mean averages is the median. The median is the value of the data point. So it's something in your data set, uh, which exactly half of the remaining values, once you take it out, are below it. Exactly half are above it. Uh, we also can call this the 50th percentile. We talk about percentile ranks, basically talking about the same idea, just not necessarily at 50%. So when you see 25th and 75th percentile GPAs and LSAT ranks, what that means is the 75th percentile means that one quarter of the other LSAT scores in your incoming class were above that, and three quarters of the remaining ones were below that. Uh, these are those two numbers I don't pick out of thin air. Those are the numbers that uh, the ABA asks to be reported. So uh, percentile ranks 
or the median, the median is just the 50th percentile. Uh, the mean and the median tell you different things. They will often, in a large enough data set, they will tend to be close to each other. They won't tend to be the same because the median will be a point in your data set, whereas the mean won't be. It will be, a, it will be sort of a result of a calculation. But uh, they will tend towards each other with a large enough data set. Um, that is, there's one exception, and that's if you have uh, strangely distributed things, which we'll talk about a little bit towards the end. I'm not going to talk about the mode. It's not very important. It will come up occasionally. Um, it's simply the, the value that appears the most often. Um, there are applications for it. They're not generally very important. So I'm not going to talk about it too much. Or at all. All right. Now we're going to get into some of the meat. Again, we got through the marrow and the bones. Now we're going to get to the meat. We'll then shoot some skin. Um, <laughs> then we'll bread it. Uh, deep fry it. And serve it up. Okay, it's a terrible KFC metaphor. But... <laughs> All right. So one thing you're going to hear is somebody will say, well, that result's statistically significant, or it's not statistically significant. That's a very weird term. Even somebody with a math background, I really was not 100% sure for a long time what people really meant by that, because it's not necessarily a technical term. There are several different ways in which a result can be significant. Um, what we tend to mean, though, is that there is some there is some trait in this sort of in our results. Um, usually, we talk about relationship between things um, that's going to tend to make it highly predictive of future results. Uh, and there's a lot of ways that this can happen. So we're usually talking about the relationship between multiple variables, uh, though not always. All right, so the first thing is correlation. We're talking about correlation in general. What I mean is, the relate is two variables have some relationship to each other. Going back to that example, LSAT scores and bar pass rates. Uh, we can tell a student has an LSAT score, we can tell several students have an LSAT score, and we can know how often students with that score pass the bar. That's in correlation. We have those two data points and we can, we can link them. So the correlation coefficient which you'll also occasionally hear referred to as a Pearson coefficient. Actually, it's a much longer name, which I never remember. It's the Pearson something, 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 something correlation coefficient. But generally, if you hear correlation coefficient or Pearson coefficient, this is what we're talking about. This is a value that is meant to represent how strongly two variables relate to one another. There is a function in Excel that will calculate this for you for your data set. Uh, I never remember the formula, and it would probably just confuse you because it confuses me when I look at it. Uh, but what it does is it gives you a number. That number will be between negative 1 and 1. So I'm going to draw the board here. It's louder than I thought it would be. So, If the correlation is, if that coefficient is negative, that means that if you graph the two variables with respect to each other, it slopes this way. That means that as we increase one variable, the other one goes down. If it's a positive number, that means that as we increase one, we increase the other. The graph slopes upward. 
away from the uh, zero, zero point. Now, the closer it is, uh, the closer it is to one or negative one, that means that that relationship is stronger. Uh, if, as it gets smaller, as that correlation coefficient gets closer to zero, that relationship is, there is less and less correlation between the two variables. If it's zero, it means that they literally have no relationship whatsoever, which is very rare to get, it's actually very rare to get zero for correlation coefficient because uh, there is generally, you can kind of read into some, some sort of relationship between things, even if it's not a very strong relationship. This is where conspiracy theories happen. Uh, this is somebody has read something in there that doesn't exist um, because they looked at too small of a data set or something. But generally speaking, if you can get to about 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, you're actually getting to relatively strong correlations. Uh, LSAT scores to uh, Bar passage rates are around a 0 0.3, 0 0.4, somewhere in that range, which is surprisingly strong. Um, else, uh, law school GPA has a much higher correlation coefficient. It's actually somewhere in the 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 range. On the other hand, undergraduate GPA is almost no effect, no relationship to bar passage rate whatsoever. Uh, the uh, one study I was looking at said uh, negative 0 0.045, which means that if anything, it's a downward slope, but it's so insignificant that it's not even worth really looking at. So correlation, most of the time, somebody says that a relate when they talk about a relationship being statistically significant, this is what they're talking about is correlation. Now, we want to only talk about relationships, we'll talk about other things being statistically significant as well. So another thing you're going to hear talked about a lot is margin of error. And margin of error is tossed around, it's not always consistently used. Um, when we talk about margin of error, what we mean is a range of values that could represent anything within that could be the actual results. Now, if you measure the entire population, you don't have a margin of error because you know the truth. Where margin of error comes in is from sampling. So uh, margin of error is purely a function of sample size. A little bit with the population size too. Um, a smaller population We'll need a smaller overall sample size to get a large, to get a, to eliminate error, but it's going to be a larger percentage of the whole population. Uh, oddly enough, to get the opinion of a town of like 30,000 people, uh, as opposed to the population of the entire, to get the feeling of the entire country, 300 million people, the, pop, the sample size you need to have a very small margin of error is not that different. Now you don't want to have everybody from the same, you don't want to have the same sample because if you're only getting people from uh, Colorado Springs, that's going to skew your results because people in Colorado Springs are probably not necessarily representative of the United States as a whole. Just like people from the United States are probably not representative of humans as a whole. Probably more so than, say, uh, Liechtenstein, but less so than, you know, everybody. Uh, so, sample size is how you is really where margin of error comes from. It has something to do with trying to correct for rep representation problems. Uh, and what it basically means is if you say 60% of people are within or 60% of people approve of this and I have a 5% margin of error, that means that the real result could be somewhere between 
60, 55 to 65, but I'm confident enough within this range that it's somewhere in there. So the bigger your sample size, the smaller the margin of error. Um, and there is, there is very much diminishing marginal returns. Uh, once you get to a very, very, very small margin of error, increasing your sample size doesn't really have much of an effect unless you end up sampling everybody. In which case, then you actually have no margin of error. All right, now the last sort of our, our significance numbers is something called the p-value. Uh, this is a measure of significance. It is related to both correlation and error. In its simplest terms, uh, this is the probability that the relationship between two variables that you have described or you have predicted based off of your data is due to random chance. That this is the odds that, based off of what I've gathered, that what I am saying, what I'm predicting here is correct. Or sorry, actually, the p-value of is not correct. That this is purely the result of random chance that I've just gathered data that happens to fit my predictions. Uh, <coughs> p-values are expressed between zero and one. One is a 100% chance that the results are coincidental. Um, you will very rarely have any sort of experiment or data collection that ends up with a p-value of one. And if you did, you've done something very, 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 very wrong. Um, typically, we're looking at numbers less than 0.1, which would be 10% chance that it's due to chance. Um, and usually we're comparing to some sort of acceptability range. Uh, that usually referred to as an alpha. Uh, the alpha value you're looking for is generally going to be between 0.01 and 0.05, depending on the field that you're of study and what exactly you're doing. Uh, and it being between 1% and 5% chance of being due to chance. So, um, as sort of an example here, this is from XKCD, which if you want to learn math humor, XKCD is full of it, also science and Tanner and stuff. But you know, your 0 0.001 p-value, 0.1% chance that it's due to error or chance, highly significant. I mean, the 0.4 is where it's significant. Above 0.5, near significance, kind of significant. And, oh, hey, look at this. Exactly 0.5. Nobody ever gets exactly 0.5. This is probably his alpha value for this particular study. And it says, oh, crap. I did something wrong. And let's redo it. All right. Getting close to the end. I'm going to try and wrap this up soon. All right. Yes? Well, going back to you know, p-values and sample size, how big of of a sample is, are, are we, should we be looking at? I mean, if sometimes you see studies of 25 people, sometimes it's 1,000, sometimes it's 10,000. It generally will depend on how big of a uh, population you have. So if you're studying your, your students at your school, if you have 500 students, generally somewhere in the 100 to 125 is going to give you very, very small amounts of error. Uh, if you're looking at all law students, you're probably going to look at more like two to three thousand. That would be roughly like what is it, fifty thousand law students, something like that. I don't remember the exact numbers, but uh, you're going to want, uh, generally speaking, with <coughs> under unless you're looking at a very small group, under a hundred is going to be error prone because you have very large chance of excluding groups and so on. Um, that's mostly trial and error, trying to figure out sample sizes for surveys and how you kind of figure that out. So that's all right. Any other questions before I move on? All right. So distributions. Um, when you start getting large amounts of data, you can start to plot them. 
and you'll start to notice that they will start to have certain um, characteristics. These are called distributions. Data will tend to cluster in certain spots, or it won't. Generally, if you're dealing with something that's um, predicted, it will tend to cluster. Um, if your data was not gathered in a very good way, or it's from, from things that don't have any relation to each other, they'll end up all over the place. But we have a lot of distributions, and the most common, the one you're probably all familiar with, especially if you've ever had to put together a grade curve, is the normal or standard distribution. Uh, distributions in general are a graph of how common particular values are for that variable. The, mo uh, the normal distribution is when our, value, our values heavily cluster around the mean, around that expected value. This is what it looks like. It's a very, it's the bell curve. It's a very big peak in the middle with that mean, that expected value, pretty much dead center. You'll have roughly even amounts of your, of your results on either side of it, and they will cluster within this bell. But very, very few falling outside of this uh, bulge. Now the standard deviation has is part of distributions. And this is a number that represents how far the data tends to vary from the expected value. Now, there's not an absolute number that represents good standard deviation because it's going to be uh, something that has to do with your actual data points. So if your data points are very large, if you're talking about like incomes, if, you're, if your expected value, if your mean income is $45,000, your standard deviation might be like $8,000. Whereas you're talking about grade points, your standard deviation might be like 0.25. Um, so very, so the standard deviation number is going to be something to do with your data points. Uh, the higher that number is with relationship to your to the size of your values, that means that your data is more spread out. If it's a, if it's relatively small compared to your values, so if your income was if your standard deviation on your income chart was ten dollars, that means everything's going to be really really clustered around that, that average. If it's thirty thousand it's going to be very spread out. Uh, sometimes people talk about something being one or two standard, deviation, standard deviations above or below the mean. That means that if the standard deviation is $8,000 from your income of $45,000, two standard deviations would mean the group that's $53,000, no, $61,000 or higher. That's what they mean by that. So the normal curve, the standard, the standard uh, distribution, follows a very strict uh, standard deviation pattern. It's actually what defines the normal distribution. Under the normal distribution, 68% of data points are within one standard deviation of mean, kind of direction. Usually roughly evenly spits a 34, 34. 95% of all data points are within two standard deviations. So again, our example of the income, $43,000 and $8,000 standard deviation. In that example, 95% of all income, so that's another good example, because I made the numbers up, would be between $29,000 and $61,000. 99.7% would be within three. So again, going back to our example, between 21 and 69. The farther you get away at this point, the uh, less, the fewer and fewer are out there in those interlands of your distribution. Which brings us to the very last thing I'm going to talk about as far as these various terms, which are outliers. An outlier is a value that is distant 
from your distribution, from your other values. Uh, this can occur by random chance of measurement error, but it can also represent something else. Uh, this is your, in grading a, an exam, this is your curve breaker. This is your person who gets all the points and all the extra credit, and it's 135% when your next highest score is 82. Um, so what the outlier could represent is something called a heavy tail or a long tail. Uh, this is a distribution that instead of clustering around the axis here, instead will curve off higher and keep going and going and going for a long time. Uh, the most common long tail distribution is in book sales, the, the one that uses an example. Um, a very small number sell, sell most of the books, but there's a, just a whole lot of things that sell one or two or three copies a year. And just keep going, and that'll keep going and going. Those things that are out there are outliers, things that don't uh, sell very often. Or you can look at the things that in that peak is the outliers. But regardless, an outlier is that data point odd. This sticks out and can neither mean um, that it's uh, an error or that there's the distribution doesn't quite fit. Uh, these are things that might be like six or seven standard distributions away from where they should be. Incomes have, a, because there's a very long tail to one direction, uh, have a lot of outliers if you take a random sample of people, somebody's going to be way over there if you have a big enough sample. Um, again, a good example of this in law school context, going back to our LSAT scores. That 25th percentile, um, a lot of schools will tend to have that 25th percentile somewhere in the high 140s, low 150s, but there might be like a 120 that they're in there that just doesn't show up because the data they use, the points they use, excluded. All right. The last thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to do this very, very quickly because I'm past my time that I wanted to go, are some tools for data analysis. Uh, three main programs I'm going to talk about. Uh, there are others that are like them. One is Excel. And I'm guessing all of you have either have Excel or have ready access to it. Um, Microsoft Excel has a very extensive library of statistics and data analysis functions. And the thing that's great about them is if you go into the stats library and you look at a function, it tells you what that function is, what results it gives you, and what data points you need to put into it. So uh, it's plug and play. You look at the data, at the, at the formula you need. You pull the data you need into the uh, into your Excel spreadsheet, and then you spit out the results. Very easy. It's m very much the simplest one of these. And there are plenty of Excel tutorials on YouTube and on the web that you can walk through how to do these things in Excel. But a lot of it is just to go through and read what the different formulas do and how to make them work. Another one that you probably have access to if you work for a university, um, as opposed to standing on law school, which you might have it, but you know, most universities have access to SPSS, which is Statistical Program for Social Sciences. It's a data management program. It is written for social science majors who, much like lawyers, are not necessarily the most math uh, uh, friendly people. It is more complex than Excel. It has a higher learning curve, but most universities if they have a license, also have training materials available for it because they have to teach their social sciences grad students how to use it. So if they can figure it out, you can figure it out too. So the last one is that I'm going to talk about very briefly is R. R is a thousand times more powerful than Excel or uh, SPSS, but it has a much higher learning curve. It is a programming language. Um, it's Built for data analysis and statistics, it's open source, so it's free. You can go to r-project.org -r and download it. It's also part of R Studio, which is free, that um, is a little bit more user-friendly environment for R. 
Um, it's designed so that users don't know they're programming. It's still a programming language and you still program with it, but it's not like having to put lines of code as detailed as you might do and so on. The big thing is that it's very, very customizable. You can build your own functions and import them. And there's a very, very vibrant development community and lots and lots of uh, people out there willing to help you learn more. Uh, there's also uh, at least two or three bar programming courses on between edX and Coursera that you can do for free um, as MOOCs that you can just that will help you through it. Through it, and there's just a lot of sources out there. It is a lot more complicated, but it's also partly because it's so customizable, is much more powerful than the other tools. So anyway, I am way past the. I am not technically out of time, but I have gone longer than I wanted to. I guess I was a little bit off on my calculation. There's margin of error there. I didn't have a big enough sample size of presentations. Any questions, comments, smart aleck remarks, fruit and vegetables you want to throw at me? Thank you. Yes? Um, I have two questions. Are you going to make your slides available? I can. Um, yes. Okay. Probably. Um, I'm just curious. Um, I know that the a lot lately, and I read something recently about Bayesian statistics. Bayesian? Bayesian? Bayesian statistics? Um, is it, yeah, is it different than? It's different than Bayesian statistics? It's just, um, Bayesian is just a, uh, it's a branch of, uh, I want to say it's a particular type of data collection, yes. but it's not something I'm a dabbler in this, so I'm not necessarily an expert. I've seen the term a lot of the times, but usually I see it as um, attempting to, like, I see Bayesian used when people are like, weighting statistics for, like, so that things don't necessarily, when they don't have enough information to complete their data set, um, they'll use Bayesian, they'll use the Bayesian terms for when they're basing off incomplete data. I don't know if that's what it is. I can look it up if you email me and remind me, I will look it up and get back to you. Thank you. Do you have any recommendations for um, I don't know, guides or introductions to people who want to learn more about big data analysis? Um, other than the dummy series, of course. <laughs> other than what? A dummy series book. I don't know if there is one, but I uh, there are. Like them. <laughs> I actually learned uh, a little bit from just like so doing some of the different books that are available on some of them in Coursera and NX. Um, Johns Hopkins has a whole certificate program on it, which uh, is a lot of work. Uh, and if you want to get the actual certificate, it's expensive. Uh, well, not expensive, expensive. But, um, there's uh, this is the, the dummiest books I've ever <laughs> I hate to say it, it's not bad. Um, okay. And uh, Wikipedia has actually got good information on this. Wikipedia for math, by the way, fantastic. <laughs> yes. There is an online program called Hawk's Learning System. H U L K S? Hawk as in. Oh, Hawk. A bird. Uh -huh. um, I used it for my MBA program a while ago, but it's really good. And Go to your own pace and it'll quiz you. So you're learning as you go. And it's not a lecture, you just read many lectures. So it kind of is a good pace because it's not five to 20 pages of lecture, it's just chunks and bits and then application. And it's really reasonably priced. The last time I checked, it was $100 maybe. Thank you. You didn't mention Stata or Stata or however you pronounce it. Um, and a lot of the ELS scholars are being taught to use that. Do you have any opinion about that as a tool for analysis? I'm not very familiar with it. So um, I'm, as I'm more familiar with uh, these because these are the ones I've used in the past and they're probably 
SPSS and Excel are the, most, are the ones everybody pretty much has access to, and since R is free, anybody can get it. And there's a lot of things learning. I'll have to look particularly, I'd have to look, read more on uh, Stata, you said? I've heard it pronounced both ways, but Stata or Stata, it's what they're teaching at the ELS, like the offered by Northwestern. I'll have to look it up. Thank you. Anything else? All right, it's, uh, it's 12.30, so um, enjoy lunch. Or 11.30. It's 12.30 my time, but I just do. <laughs>